While most couples would be content to spend their honeymoon lounging on a beach in an exotic locale, those close to newlyweds Glenn and Bessie Hyde say they were not most couples. Their honeymoon plan was to raft the rapids of the Colorado River and continue their possibly record-breaking trip through the Grand Canyon. Glenn was 29 when he embarked on this trip and his new bride was just 22. Little did they know this trip would be their last. Or was it? Glenn Roland Hyde had been a farmer in Twin Falls, Idaho, before meeting Bessie, whose maiden name was Haley. She was originally from Parkersburg, West Virginia. While Glenn was a lover of the outdoors from an early age, Bessie had always loved the theater. In high school, she played Juliet in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Graduating in 1924, she moved by herself to California, later enrolling at the California School of Fine Art in San Francisco. The couple first met in 1927, encountering each other while on a passenger ship traveling to Los Angeles, just one year prior to their mysterious disappearance. At the time the two met, Bessie was still legally married. Just one day after Bessie's divorce from her first husband was finalized, she and Glenn were married on April 10th, 1928. Glenn had a decent amount of experience with river running, having traveled the Salmon and Snake Rivers in Idaho with a well-known river runner named Cap Gulik in 1926. Bessie was more of a novice, however, they decided to work together to set a new speed record for traveling through the Grand Canyon. By 1928, only 45 people had managed to ever fully traverse the length of the Grand Canyon by boat. This feat would have also put Bessie in the record books as the first documented woman to make the treacherous journey. The river included parts where challenging rapids and unpredictable currents presented themselves, but the couple was more than halfway finished with their trip, which had gone well so far. In October of 1928, the Hydes went to Green River, Utah, where Hyde built his own boat, a 20-foot wooden sweep scow, the type used by river runners of that time in Idaho. He named the boat Rain in the Face, after a Standing Rock Sioux chief with the same name who had fought with Sitting Bull at Little Bighorn in 1876. The couple set off down the canyons of the Green and Colorado Rivers on October 20th, 1928. The couple successfully traversed Labyrinth, Stillwater, and Cataract Canyons without incident. Upon reaching the Grand Canyon, they disembarked at Bright Angel Creek to ascend the South Kaibab Trail. It was there at the South Rim that they encountered Emery Knob, who was a renowned photographer and river guide. While visiting his studio and home on the Canyon Rim, Emery led them around the area and extended an offer to provide Glenn with life jackets, the one thing that seemed to be missing from his boat. Glenn declined the offer. Emery recalls Bessie looking at his youngest daughter and admiring her outfit, saying aloud, quote, I wonder if I shall ever wear pretty shoes again. When questioned later, Emery remarked that Bessie appeared to be ready to abandon the journey at that very moment, but says that Glenn persisted, saying that they would resume their descent down the trail the following day. Before departing, Emery took a photograph of the couple, their last portrait. While near the river, they encountered Adolf Sutro, the grandson of the late Adolf Sutro Sr., a well-known property developer whose contributions are said to have shaped the urban fabric of late 19th century San Francisco. Intrigued by their boat, Sutro Jr. expressed interest in joining the Hides for the day, intending to hike out at Hermit Trail. Glenn agreed and ferried Sutro the eight miles to Hermit Creek. Upon reaching their destination, Sutro disembarked, becoming the final individual to witness the couple alive. They were last seen Sunday, November 18th, 1928, when they boated away from a supply station at the Hermit Rapids. As they floated down the river, the Hydes paddled their raft and vanished into history. 
Lynn's father, Roland, initiated a search even before the couple were considered overdue at Needles, California on December 6, 1928. He conducted an extensive search for his missing son and daughter-in-law, employing various strategies, such as orchestrating a launch of a multiple river expedition and enlisting the assistance of Native American trackers to scour the rim. The concerned father also successfully obtained authorization from the Secretary of War, Dwight Davis, for an aerial search of the canyon. On December 19th, the search efforts yielded results, as military planes spotted the scow lodged mid-river at River Mile 237. The pilots reported that the boat appeared relatively undisturbed, sparking renewed hope in Rollin. It was reported that the boat remained upright and fully intact, with the supplies still secured. The search party, which included Emery and Ellsworth Knob, embarked to recover the vessel. On Christmas morning, after a difficult journey, they came upon the scow drifting silently in a tranquil and calm spot of the river just before mile marker 237. The brothers, professionals in photography by trade, documented the scene. Upon boarding the vessel, they discovered everything was undisturbed. Books, diaries, various provisions, attire, and even a firearm was still present on the boat, yet the hides were nowhere to be found. Gathering what they could, the party unhooked and released the boat. Emery Knob's decision to sever the bowline and release the boat, undertaken for motives that remain undisclosed, subsequently drew significant criticism directed towards him for this action. A camera retrieved from the boat by the brothers revealed that the last photo was taken near River Mile Marker 165, likely on or around November 27th. Unfortunately for investigators, the diary offered zero insight as to who or what made Bessie and her husband abandon their boat on the water. Evidence from the search suggested that the couple had recently reached River Mile 226, Diamond Creek, where they presumably set up camp. Bessie's journal specifically mentions their passage beyond mile marker 231. Historian Otis R. Martson put forth a compelling argument that the couple may have encountered submerged rocks in the turbulent rapids near River Mile 232, resulting in their being swept from the boat. He stated that the danger of the area is that it is filled with, quote, pieces of granite wall that lie submerged where they have damaged, snared, or capsized more boats than any other location in the canyon. However, critics of this opinion say the boat was found upright and the food and supplies were found dry. As the new year arrived, newspapers reluctantly acknowledged the presumed demise of the hides and shifted their focus to other stories. The grief-stricken father returned to Idaho, where he read and grappled with the contents of Bessie's journal, hoping to uncover any clues. The following winter, he returned to the area the couple went missing from in search of their bodies, but his efforts proved fruitless. Over time, various theories emerged. Bessie's father leaned towards the possibility of murder, while river runner Norman Neville said that drowning was the most plausible explanation. The case got stranger in later years, though, when random people started coming forward claiming to be one of the missing hides. The speculation surrounding the Hyde's disappearance reached such a high level that it garnered attention from the LA Times. In 1971, a woman on a commercial boating trip claimed to be Bessie Hyde, alleging that she had fatally stabbed Glenn in a fit of anger before starting a new life in Peach Springs, Arizona. However, when later confronted by reporters, the woman, identified as Elizabeth Cutler, denied making such statements despite multiple contrary reports. Investigators thought a significant revelation had come to light following Emery Knob's passing in 1976. Being the last of the Hyde's acquaintances to see the pair, he was questioned and cleared. After his death, they began to clean his garage, and in 1977, a human skull with a visible bullet hole was found. 
Initial examinations suggested that it belonged to a man in his 20s, similar in stature to Glenn Hyde. This fueled massive speculation, but in 2008, forensic analysis confirmed it was not Glenn's skull. Further investigation revealed that Emery, who had served as a county coroner jury representative, likely retained the skull from a separate case following the trial's end. In 1992, after the death of the famous Grand Canyon River guide Georgie Clark, intriguing items were discovered among her belongings. These items included a pistol, alongside the Hyde's marriage certificate and a birth certificate under the name Betsy DeRoss. This raised multiple questions about Clark's possible connection to Bessie Hyde, although local authorities chose not to reopen the case despite the discovery of the marriage certificate. Bessie's journals have in them a poem written by Bessie that some see as an eerie foreshadowing of events. The short poem reads, Oh, mama dear, please come. My dolly must be drowned. When I put her in the creek, she sunk without a sound. We, Betty's eyes filled with tears. Where could poor dolly be? Perhaps she'd turned into a mermaid and drifted out to sea. Glenn and Bessie Hyde remain missing to this day. At 10 p.m. on New Year's Day in 2008, 15-year-old Irish teenager Amy Fitzpatrick said goodbye to her friend Ashley Rose in Mijas Costa in Milagro, Spain, and disappeared. At the time, Amy was living with her mother, Audrey Fitzpatrick, and her stepfather, David Mahone. Ashley later said that the two had spent New Year's Eve together, looking after Ashley's younger brother and chatting with friends online. The next day, they ventured into the city in Fuñola but returned to Calahonda upon realizing it was a holiday. Ashley's mother, Deborah, recalls that Ashley asked her if Amy could stay with them again that night. She said, quote, I said it would be best if she went home and wished her family a happy new year. Ashley walked with Amy to the entrance of her neighborhood where they said goodbye. This would be the last time that Ashley would see her friend ever again. The walk back to Amy's home was short, and she was expected to arrive by 10.10 p.m. However, she never arrived back home and has not been seen since. That night, Amy was wearing a brown, crushed velvet tracksuit bottom and a black t-shirt with the word Diesel written in various colors. The next morning, a friend asked Ashley if she wanted to go out. Ashley then called Amy's mother, Audrey, to ask if Amy wanted to come. However, Amy's mother said that she thought Amy was still with Ashley. It was at that point that Amy was reported missing to police. The Guardia Civil, who took charge of the investigation, searched the path between the two girls' homes, inch by inch, but did not find any sign whatsoever to indicate that a kidnapping or a crime had taken place. This led the investigators to believe that Amy had run away. Detectives had certain grounds to believe this likely. She had gone missing voluntarily in the past, although it was only for a matter of hours. They also noted that she'd recently argued with her family over a canceled trip to Ireland. Witnesses also say that Amy did not have a good relationship with her stepfather, David Mahone. However, the theory that Amy had left of her own volition came to nothing, and in the absence of evidence, ultimately, police believed that she was kidnapped. The case took a bizarre turn, however, when, in August of 2008, the home of Mahone and Fitzpatrick's lawyer in Riviera del Sol was broken into, and the laptop that was used in the search for Amy was stolen. In addition, Amy's Nokia mobile phone was also stolen. The 32-year-old lawyer, Juan José de la Fuente Taxido, said the burglars got into his property by forcing open a locked garden gate. He said that the stolen documents included confidential police reports about Amy's disappearance. And he told reporters, quote, I believe the burglary was related to Fitzpatrick's disappearance. It makes no sense that they took documents which are financially worthless and left behind all my expensive valuables like TVs, computers, and music equipment. Those responsible for the robbery were never caught. Almost a year later, in June of 2009, Audrey received a phone call from someone claiming to know where Amy was being kept alive. Audrey described the caller as a man with a notable African accent. 
The caller claimed that Amy had been kidnapped and was alive in Madrid. He also later demanded a ransom of 500,000 euros via text message. Police attempted to trace the phone numbers given for the ransom, but found both to be unregistered prepaid numbers. Nothing ever came from the tipster, and police say it could very well have been a hoax by parties unrelated to the crime. Audrey Fitzpatrick has taken on private investigators who have been working on Amy's case since 2008. They are the same private investigators used to look into the disappearance of Madeline McCain. In May of 2012, it was reported that an infamous Irish serial killer named Eric Lucky Wilson had actually been the one to murder Amy. Her parents believe that this particular information is credible, however, a body is yet to be found, and no specific evidence ties Amy to the serial killer. Some say that it may be wishful thinking on Amy's mother's part. In May 2013, five years after Amy went missing, another tragedy struck the family. Dean, Amy's older brother, was stabbed to death by none other than his stepfather, David Mahone. On May 6, 2016, Mahone was found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to seven years in prison. He was again questioned about Amy's disappearance, but denied any involvement in it. Audrey Fitzpatrick stuck by Dave Mahone despite the fact that he killed her son. No body has been found in the case, and Amy still remains missing to this day.